Thank you so much, Elder Duquette, for those fine words and prayer. And uh, we're, uh, we're very grateful being able to come together today. And we ask, thank you for helping us open in this with such good intentions and uh, broad perspective. And uh, water is what unites us all in the past, the present, and the future. And, uh, and so we, your, your blessings are critical to us. And thank you so much. The, um, <clears throat> the next person I have the pleasure of introducing is Dr. Karen Chad, our Vice President of Research. And she's just not any ordinary Vice President of Research. Uh, she's a rather special Vice President of Research. Before there was a Global Institute for Water Security, before there was a Global Water Futures, there is Dr. Karen Chad with a plan and a strategy and uh, that was executed uh, with precision, with finesse, with beauty, and with great success. She's the only Vice President of Research in Canada who presides over two uh, Canada First Research Excellence Fund awards. U of S was the only one. It wasn't U of T, it wasn't UBC, it wasn't McGill, it was here. And, uh, and her constant, tireless advocacy, strategic planning, and leadership are why we have a Global Institute for Water Security, why we've had this fantastic stream of exceptional researchers brought in from around the world uh, to uh, help us in Canada on these problems and, uh, and why we can celebrate World Water uh, Day today. So Karen, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for your prayer, Elder Duquette, which reminds us all of the sacredness of water. And of course, John, thank you for your ever so kind words, and uh, as we all know, um, it's, it really takes a village, you know, to have this uh, degree of excellence, and as I was told many years ago, just to surround myself with truly great and smart people, and, uh, and I'm truly uh, honored to have uh, John's leadership as well as many of you here, your leadership as well. So good afternoon. What a beautiful, beautiful day in sunny Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan, and indeed in Canada. I'm Karen Chad. I'm the Vice President of Research uh, for this great university, and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to the, our University of Saskatchewan World Water Day event a day that truly reminds us to appreciate one of our most precious resources, and that is our water. It's particularly fitting that our Global Institute of Water Security is hosting this event, commemorating World Water Day, given that the sustainable management of freshwater resources is absolutely the key goal of our institute. As John mentioned, the theme of this year's World Water Day is leaving no one behind. This theme ties very directly to the sixth goal of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, to ensure water availability and sustainable water management for all by 2030. As sustainable development progresses, everyone must benefit. At present, as we know, more than 2 billion people around the world live without safe water at home. Rural people, refugees, indigenous communities are often overlooked as they try to access and manage the water, the safe water that they need. To leave no one behind, we must focus on including people who have been marginalized or who have been ignored. Many First Nations in Canada are facing long-term water boil advisories and poor sanitation. Despite federal efforts over the past couple of years, there are still 64 long-term water advisories on First Nations community, according to the latest Indigenous Services Canada report. I'm very proud, therefore, that our U of S-led Global Water Futures Program under the visionary leadership of John Pomeroy is working with Indigenous partners to co-develop solutions to drinking water and other water quality issues. 
and of course our researchers and community members side by side plan to share this co-created knowledge with government agencies responsible for water management, remediation, and of course, quality monitoring. It is also heartening for some of you who have seen the federal budget uh, governance, um, federal government's announcement this week in the budget. It announced $739 million to eliminate drinking water advisories on reserves. And you'll hear much more on this topic of leaving no one behind from Claudia Pauls-Wassel, an international thought leader in water governance and management who will speak, be speaking shortly as the first recipient of the Global Institute for Water Security Howard Weider Lecture Award. I'd like to offer my personal congratulations to Claudia and welcome her once again to our campus. As many of you know, Claudia is not only a world-renowned researcher, but she's family here. And over the past few years, she has brought with her not only her great intellect and her wisdom and experience, but she has brought a warmth and gentleness of soul to our campus and to all of us who have had the great pleasure of getting to know her and working alongside her. Thank you, Claudia. I'd also like to offer congratulations to Grant Ferguson, Associate Professor in Engineering, who will be receiving the Institute's Water Security Research Excellence Award today. And to Lila Dahabadi, who will be receiving the Best Doctoral Thesis Award. The excellence that you and your colleagues here today strive for in your daily work is one reason that the University of Saskatchewan is ranked number one in water resources research in Canada and number 18 in the world. On a final note, our research excellence is also underscored, as John mentioned, by the fact that today, Professor Jay Famoletti, Executive Director of our Water Institute and Canada's 150 Research Chair in Hydrology and Remote Sensing, is among the panel of experts giving a live World Water webcast from Washington, D.C. That preeminent panel is hosted by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine and the Pew Charitable Trust, as John alluded to earlier. The goal is to present the latest findings of the world's limited water supply and what can be done. So I am so proud that we are participating in an important event like this with such global reach. I commend each and every one of you on your efforts to address water challenges that affect each and every one of us. And I wish you all the best with this exciting program this afternoon. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. And the, uh, we appreciate your leadership of this very, very much, and uh, that needs to be known. So I'll say a few words uh, from the Global Institute for Water Security. As uh, Karen uh, mentioned, uh, Jay cannot be here. He's speaking at the Pew Center, actually a few hours earlier in Washington, brought up the issues of water supply, drought, sustainability very, very strongly. I uh, said, uh, can you sort out all the problems in Washington? He said, he'll work on a few of them. And uh, so that's, so we wish him all the luck in that. Uh, this is an interesting uh, World Water Day uh, because the Global Institute actually is involved in several of them. So we have, uh, we have our man in Washington, but we also have our man in Canmore, and that's Dr. Martin Clark. And he'll be speaking of the World Water Day in Canmore, Alberta this evening. Uh, at the Canmore Geoscience Center. So you could still hop on a plane and you could get there and enjoy both of them if you're uh, very, very keen. Um, uh, but you'd have trouble managing the one in Birmingham, England, uh, where Dr. Patricia Gober is speaking at the University of Birmingham and uh, joined there by uh, our Howard Wheater and Jeff McDonald. So, the, uh, so we, we truly are having a, uh, a global reach on this day. The, uh, these are very good times for GIWS. The uh, world has finally come to its senses and realized that we're number one in Canada. And, uh, but it only ranks us as number 18 worldwide. And so I expect that to change positively next year. Uh, uh, so it, it, with prairie modesty, we say, yeah, that's all right. But it's, uh, it's really all right. 
And uh, it's wonderful that, uh, that the world is beginning to recognize the strengths of the University of Saskatchewan in water. And, the, uh, and of course, uh, we've known about the issues for many years, and the issues seem to be uh, becoming more and more prominent, often unfortunately, uh, around the world. And the uh, terrible floods occurring right now in, in Africa, uh, recently in, in Southeast Asia, in the United States, uh, continuing drought and floods in Australia, uh, uh, things are not letting up, so uh, we have to carry on. Anyway, the, um, uh, there are other um, events coming up, and uh, one thing I'd like to announce here with, uh, very happily is that we have uh, Mr. Uh, the Honorable Ralph Goodale will be opening up a water security session in Ottawa on April 11th uh, that is being organized by the University of Saskatchewan, the Global Institute, Global Water Futures, and our partner universities. And that will be a session on water uh, solutions for Canadians. And so it'll be an information ses session. A number of MPs and senators have already indicated that they'll be attending as our other organizations. And so if you're able to be in Ottawa, we uh, are delighted to uh, speak to you further there. Uh, at the, uh, and please contact uh, Fanny Adapa, our assistant director, for information on attending that. The, uh, at this point, we want to uh, carry on with our, our wonderful agenda today. Uh, we have uh, the Howard Wheater Lecture, the first Howard Wheater Lecture coming up. Uh, we have the GIS Award winners and lightning talks by our top poster authors. And then in the end, I understand it's, it's beers at Alexander's, which is often how water days end up. So, uh, so that's all fine. Uh, at, at this point, uh, the, uh, we, we value our, our student participation very, very much in this, and I would like to uh, invite up our uh, uh, Richard Hemley, the president of the GIS, GIWS Students and Young Researchers Group, uh, to uh, uh, offer us uh, greetings from there. Richard is a uh, Master's of Environment and Sustainability uh, student, and he's been a member of the GIWS Student and Young Researchers Association for two years now, and he's acting president since September. So Richard, are you, there you are, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, John. Um, thank you for the prayer and uh, respect for the earth that we uh, laid out here today. And thanks for everyone coming and uh, making this happen. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Richard. I'm the president of the GIWS Student and Young Research Asso Association. Um, and I just wanted to uh, take a moment to bring greetings uh, on behalf of us. Uh, we have a pretty uh, eager and committed uh, committee this year. Uh, we're hoping to do uh, lots of fun things and uh, be a positive impact on everyone's mental health and leave no one behind, so make sure to check your inboxes. Uh, we had a really wonderful ski trip this last weekend, which was very beautiful, and uh, it was interesting to see some people get out on the slopes that hadn't done that before. Um, and yes, please join us at Alexander's uh, at the end of the day today for some libations to celebrate this day. Um, and we are here uh, coordinating the poster contest, so have fun with that, and good luck. All right, so now the great fun begins. It seems, it's only a year ago, it seems longer, uh, that we had the Howard Wheater Symposium. And uh, this was a tremendous gathering of great minds uh, from around the world and across Canada uh, to speak on advances in hydrology and water resources that somehow associated themselves with the career of Howard Wheater. And, um, and to see the breadth of his influence of ideas, of friendship, of support uh, in the UK, in Canada, uh, but people from everywhere, from South America, from Australia, from Asia, uh, uh, from Africa. It was a, a, a truly a momentous occasion to have such a symposium in Saskatoon. And we liked it so much, we said, well, it'd be nice to have uh, some way of uh, commemorating Howard's contribution to the university, which has been profound and also a way of remembering that wonderful symposium. And uh, so we can keep a little piece of it going as we move forward. And, and so we decided to implement the uh, Howard Wheater Lecture Series. And uh, this meant we would have a Howard Wheater Lecturer. And then we thought, well, all right, what day should we have it on? Well, it clearly it has to be on World Water Day. So, uh, so that made great sense. And then, so that was last year, and then we, uh, uh, as we often do, we got on to other things and carried on. 
And then some point over the winter, um, I, I think Fanny said, whoa, what are you guys doing about uh, World Water Day? And the Howard Weider lecture, so, wow, okay, right. We have to organize it, so we did. Uh, but the uh, decision making, the thinking was a split second uh, sort of thing because the, the person was obvious. Um, uh, who would be the first uh, Howard Weider lecturer, uh, the first awardee of this? And it is uh, Professor Claudia uh, Paul Wolstow of the uh, University of Osnabrück in Germany. Um, why? Well, uh, Dr. Paul Wolstow has had a tremendous influence in the uh, field of water governance and management, not just in Germany, but around the world, and even in Canada. And the, um, and the, uh, she has uh, uh, one worked with, with Howard and with Pat Gober in the past on issues of global water governance. Uh, she's been a leader of this. She's written many books, many papers, uh, books translated into languages all over the world, and been recognized uh, for her cutting edge research in understanding uh, the importance of social learning, anticipatory governance, adaptive management, and knowledge mobilization for sustainable water development. And she really brought these ideas to the forefront. And that you see them as core parts of global water futures is no coincidence whatsoever. Uh, but it was her innovation and development of these concepts uh, that provided something that we could uh, bring forward and develop. And uh, so we're, um, she has uh, uh, had senior roles and chairs at the uh, EWAG Institute in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, currently uh, deputy director in Osnabrück uh, with the Institute for Environmental Systems Research. She has bridged physical and social sciences, policy and governance in a way that is exceptionally rare and exceedingly difficult to do. Uh, you've got to have a good brain for this. The, um, she not only speaks to high-level groups the, at the United Nations and, and others uh, in the uh, UNESCO, and they know her very, very well, but she's the sort of person that you can take to a remote corner of the Yukon and, uh, and uh, introduce her to some, some of the local people, and they know her work and, uh, because it's significant to their lives as well. Uh, in, uh, in the most remote corners of Canada, as well as in the major centers of the world. And that's a, a particularly wide bandwidth and spectral width of, uh, of approach, which is uh, very interesting. She's had significant roles with European Union pr programs and, uh, and with the uh, uh, Water Futures, Sustainable Water Futures uh, program, which is part of Future Earth, which we contribute to as a Canadian node. So the, um, but she, also is very significantly a visiting professor at the University of Saskatchewan with respect to her contributions to Global Water Futures and she uh, is a member of the International Advisory uh, Panel of Global Water Futures. And so she uh, will be coming back to visit us in May, is interested in further engagement and she may raise this with some of the work and projects we have going on in governance and uh, has a, a particular interest in indigenous water issues. Uh, I also uh, can announce that she will be uh, one of our plenary speakers at the Global Water Futures meeting downtown so that we can share her with the uh, broader Global Water Futures community when we get uh, 500 or 600 people here in Saskatoon in May. So um, without further ado, uh, we're honored uh, to have Claudia here to speak and I ask her to come up and to deliver the first Howard Weider lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction for the praise and thank you for the water as well <laughs> that I don't draw into water scarcity and it's uh, definitely it's a major pleasure and also honor to be the first Howard Water uh, Howard Weter lecturer <laughs> Howard Water <laughs> Howard Weter lecturer here and uh, also start a tradition that we probably continue now each World Water Day and uh, so what I will talk today about is uh, sustainable development goals, signposts for sustainable water future, in order to address also the topic of the World Water Day, you never want behind and connect it also to my research. The sustainable development goals, most of you at least have seen them, may know them, 
they are not so far spread in the general German population. I know it's about Canada. Everyone in principle should know them. There are 17 goals. One is the water goal, goal number six. They have been adopted in 2015 by the UN General Assembly as a follow-up of the development goals, the Millennium Development Goals. And there's already sustainable development goals suggest or says it's broader, much broader agenda than the Millennium Development Goals. It embraces really sustainable development, in particular relevant for each country of the planet, which I also will highlight, not only for developing countries. And uh, they are a resolution. A resolution is not a binding commitment. It's a kind of voluntary agreement of all the nations uh, that engage now in implementing this kind of process. And uh, leaving no one behind, uh, that has been uh, is the major premise of this uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, namely 2030, much of the goals uh, should be achieved. And that has also been adopted now by the World Water Day this year. This is said that uh, really leaving no one behind really means that uh, goals and targets are met for all nations and peoples and for all segments of society. So really being a very equitable kind of, uh, of uh, development. And in terms of uh, who is left behind or is currently behind and is at risk to being left behind also in the future, on one hand, it's obvious the South compared to the North. In the South, we have all the developing countries, mainly the developing countries, not all. And they are, as we'll see um, later, still there, still behind, and they may, may struggle not to be further behind, but really become a more, a more an equitable kind of a planet. But in particular, also in all of these countries, the underprivileged groups, First Nations, we've heard from Karen Chart that also here in Canada, First Nations uh, have uh, less access to, uh, for example, um, safe drinking water supplies. Often these are unprivileged and pure uh, groups of society that are not uh, keeping up with the others. But also, and that's probably not as obvious, not as obvious from the previous statement, biodiversity and ecosystems. That is particularly crucial, often not overseen, that there's a certain tension between environmental attention. Sometimes it's still uh, um, development is prioritized over uh, the, um, the environmental part of uh, sustainability, which would be fatal, a very, very bad uh, development if we don't really make sure that sustainable development will really proceed by an, equi uh, an equal kind of uh, attention to the economic, the social, and the environmental dimension of development come back to this also in my talk. So that's uh, the challenge that we are embarking on and what I will talk about in my lecture is first, uh, address more the current state of implementation of SDG 6, uh, talk about also about the challenges, but also a little bit about the whole way how these uh, um, sustainable development goals are implemented. Then more about the dependencies among the SDGs, also in particular with respect and with the importance of uh, just achieving the water goal and highlight this more by some example of really complex resource management challenges in the nexus of water, energy and food. And finally also address more the frontiers of governance research, giving some thoughts about uh, our own research where we try to address, to address these challenges. So implementations of the SDGs, current state of implementation of the goal six. So each of the goals, uh, of the 17 goals, has a number of targets. So overall, um, you see this go the water goal has uh, uh, six, others have seven, eight, others have five, four. And each of the targets, uh, um, I don't know whether you can read this, but at least has uh, indicators. So um, for each of the targets, uh, there the has been a process where the countries and also the statistical bureaus of all the nation states agreed on a process. How do we want to monitor these goals? Because there is you know, regular monitoring ongoing to really keep track on where, uh, how are the countries doing. And what is quite interesting, and I think that's quite typical for water, not only at uh, the UN level, at the global level, but often for responsibility of water issues in, at, at, in national governments, you see all the custodian agencies, so all kind of agencies at the UN who are responsible for one part of monitoring one target. For example, WHO, the World Health Organization, and UNICEF, more on the drinking water goal. You have UN Environment, 
and uh, uh, UNEP, UN Water, that monitor and other goals. So a whole breadth of uh, a whole range of authorities that address these various aspects of water, which also makes it the water, water goal so uh, challenging because of this responsibility is so fragmented to really uh, develop a more coherent view. So this is uh, normally the, the process that you collect all these indicators to really make a report on how countries are doing. And last year, now the reporting process works such, you have regular high-level political forums in New York, and every few years, uh, water goal, uh, every year different goals are on the agenda that are monitored, uh, talk about progress, and last year, there was, uh, uh, the water goal was one of the goals that was discussed at this high-level political forum. That was the reason why UN Water, that is a coordination body, and bring together all these various responsibilities in the UN uh, system, uh, work on water, um, uh, collected uh, uh, the first uh, comprehensive report, a kind of baseline, where are we now, in order to monitor regular progress in terms of how we're doing. So I'll show you some of the few um, of these uh, current states in terms of monitoring of achieving the water goal. So first of all, drinking water. In quite a few countries at least have basic access to drinking water services. Uh, and uh, so uh, when you see the, the kind of data, it's always showing you the latest data that are available. And by the way, these are also the data that have been used to prepare the latest water, but water development report that was just launched two days ago. Um, and leaving the one behind. So we see, again, as always, we see Africa is a bit of, a, of one of the, 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 the continents that is, is really having most trouble. If you move next to a more safely managed drinking water service, so that is, uh, they make a distinction between basic and safely managed drinking water services, we already know that quite a few countries are gray. Gray means that um, there are no data available. That also applies for uh, Canada that uh, uh, hasn't yet uh, really been able to really bring together the data on the current state of safely managed drinking water services for all the various groups. And, uh, and the latest World Water Development Report, as I highlighted, was just launched uh, two, I think two days ago in, in Paris at UNESCO that is addressing leaving no one behind, had uh, one of uh, their boxes there, one of the examples that that drinking water supply is not only a problem of developing countries, but also of the developed world. They brought this uh, problem of First Nations drinking water supplies on one hand as a problem, but also as a sign that countries have embarked to really improve the situation. And indeed, uh, that's what also Karen Chad has mentioned, that is uh, uh, the current, this, uh, boiling uh, the, 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 uh, the drinking water advisories in different parts of Canada. So there is a major, a tremendous improvement. So it should be a really, um, uh, all should be, be uh, there should be no drinking water advisories be required for First Nation um, communities in 2022. And uh, so there is, is definitely things start to improve. Some of the challenges that uh, uh, definitely in terms of governance that Canada is facing in this respect is, and I'll come back to that also later, uh, not very harmonious uh, coordination between the national level or the split responsibilities between national and provincial levels. But uh, we'll address this later on the governance issue. So improvement there. But also sanitation, again, a similar uh, few picture that uh, even um, basic sanitation services are not available, for example, in most parts of Africa, but also parts of Asia. But uh, another one is reporting that I also want to show you the challenge of national monitoring. I will not go to each target, but only highlight key issues uh, using some of uh, uh, these targets as examples. Water use and scarcity. Water use and scarcity is more uh, generally, uh, this one indicator is water stress, which is, looks at the amount of water which is withdrawn compared to what is available. And if you look, for example, a huge country like Canada, we have very little water stress, which may not really apply to all parts of it, but it becomes even more obvious in a, a country like Australia where as a whole it has very little water stress, but uh, I guess most of you have become aware, have heard um, about the huge droughts that occur, that part of the country in north, in Darwin, for example, that's uh, 
uh, in the tropical north, you have lots of water, lots of rainfall which ends up in the ocean, but you have parts of the country which are extremely dry, ex huge drought problems. So that is one of the issues. This national reporting is not so capturing just in big, diverse countries the real challenges that need to be addressed in order to achieve the water goal. And the next goal that is uh, particularly um, uh, relevant also for our own work, I'll show you later also a project, how we further contribute to improving this part of the implementation that is an own goal that is uh, focusing on integrated water resources management, also a governance, a management goal, because uh, as I will highlight later still, governance is key to achieving water issues or dealing with sustainable water management. And uh, one of the processes that has already started prior to the SDG monitoring process is looking at the implementation of IWM. That has been as a major kind of guiding principle for water policy since uh, even one or two de several decades already. And uh, uh, so we already know that uh, there is in some countries there is some progress. In many countries, again in Africa, more little progress. Remarkably, there is no reporting in most of North America, which you could say, right, the Trump administration is not paying too much attention to really getting further data. That's at the moment uh, not environment may not be at the highest concern, but also Canada hasn't yet uh, managed to really collect the data for uh, really addressing the state of IWM in, um, in, uh, in this country, which I found also astonishing, but probably as I highlighted, given the current lack of uh, the national level to really um, coordinate across provinces, perhaps not too astonishing scope for improvement. But how, what is there, just to say, what is really, uh, how is this kind of indicator developed? Just for IWM, you have, it's not, I would say, a major effort compared to other, other kind of data collection that is more or less having capacity and spending some kind of effort in order to collect just with the questionnaire data on the current state of implementation that is more on the enabling environment for governance, institutional participation, also at national and subnational levels, the management instruments that are used, and financing. This kind of uh, um, uh, um, um, indicators have been developed on the Global Water Partnership approach for IWM. There are also challenges to this kind of monitoring process. I've been involved in really setting up this whole kind of program as well. And, uh, obviously, if you just have national governments filling or ticking out these boxes, the question is how reliable or how robust are the indicators, the answers that you get. The suggestion is, and then it would really become a diagnostic tool to engage really stakeholders in the whole process of uh, collecting this data, but that's, that's uh, starting to improve now, also getting this kind of indicator. Now to the final indicator I want to discuss here on this implementation is the ecosystem target. There is a bit of dire situation in terms of data. You see if there has been an own report just to say we're in the state of really um, reporting and uh, there, the, the trends are clear, wetlands are disappearing, but we have a very poor situation about really having comparable data on the state of uh, aquatic ecosystems that are internationally comparable. That definitely needs to improve because that uh, is a key issue that, uh, that requires more attention. But, and uh, uh, that also has been highlighted here, in particular in this report, showing very much here uh, that uh, the target in the center is the target for uh, the ecosystem to really uh, look at the current state of ecosystems. It shows how important this target is also for other water-related goals, for IWM, but also for safe drinking water. But also it shows that it's also very important for other, for example, other goals like ecosystems on land, but also for climate change-related resilience. So all highlighting the connectivities and the need to really improve here the data situation. All right, so, uh, and that, uh, just one more also, how is the state of reporting on SDG tricks in Canada? Everyone who's interested, it's a very transparent process. You can see it online. Many countries do it, Canada as well. You can really have a look at the current state of reporting and from uh, the uh, 12 targets, uh, four, Canada has reported on four, one is not relevant, but still looks for data for seven of the 12 targets where data are currently 
exploring data sources. There's on one hand definitely some scope for the scientific community to contribute, but also scope for authorities to improve uh, uh, or put in more capacities to really um, get the data together. All right, so just to summarize more instead of implementation, there are sometimes competing or even conflicting targets in different SDGs and they are often not well understood. The interlinkages are, don't receive as much attention yet as they might uh, require. Some are scale or region dependent trade of and synergies. I briefly addressed it when I showed you this national reporting on water stress. And some of the existing indicators for measuring progress on achieving the SDGs are not yet sufficiently represented. They are not conceptually clear or measurable or lack adequate data. So the first kind of indicators has been a compromise really to be able to have a national reporting service. And also uh, the process of reporting, and that's uh, I still address in when I talk about our governance project, doesn't really support what I would call a diagnostic approach, moving from addressing the situation to seeing, all right, how can we improve and transformative change. I should say that also has been part of a position paper we developed as part of a major German water program compared to Global Water Futures that is not organized or managed by one university, but it's a, a, a lot of coordinated projects uh, across of Germany where we developed a position paper on SDG implementation and uh, also it was presented at the high-level political forum in uh, in, um, in New York last year, there is a lot of attention and there is also an also opportunity to really also collaborate with Global Water Futures. There is definitely more demand also to get in more science in, in this whole reporting process. Okay, so far about giving you, discussing a bit the current state of implementing SDG 6, where we are, but also challenges in terms of getting the data, but also not only having the data, the indicators, but using the data to um, uh, really have some scope or start some process of improvement. And what is important is that implementing the SDGs is a challenge both for the developed and the developing world and interdependencies are numerous. I would like to highlight this for the water energy food nexus first more when we talk at the SDG level but then at a, for a very concrete um, example how this is a phase that we have, for example, in Germany. So for the SDGs, what you can, uh, people have looked or tried to address to which extent are for the SDGs, are interdependencies are taken into consideration. And there has been an analysis that looked at SDGs as networks of targets. So try to see, do different targets make explicit linkages to other goals? So what this reflects is a network analysis on the degree of explicit mentioning interconnectivities between the various SDGs. And why are hunger, um, energy, water, and climate change are highlighted in green? That's highlighted because uh, this report also showed that there is currently these goals that are perceived as pretty crucial for implementing more uh, integrated agenda have not, uh, in terms of targets and the interlinkages have not yet received a very high attention in the way how the SDGs are phrased and formulated. You see more from, uh, from the political agenda, inequity, poverty, economic development have received a far more prominent role in terms of their being central for the whole process. And, and that, that message was that needs requires more attention, both the degree of interlinkages but also the importance of the environmental goals. So look, things look like different as always when you ask scientists. There was an assessment of interlinkages from uh, ICSU, uh, an, an expert, uh, a very broad expert questionnaires. First of all, you see the density of linkages. Yeah, So uh, things are interdependent, but you also, uh, and you can do more elaborate analysis, the water, energy, food goals, and climate change receive a much higher attention. So that's something that currently work is ongoing to really highlight also at different levels and scales the importance of finding also indicators and also in the process of making these interdependencies explicit because otherwise the goals can't be achieved. As I will highlight now and show for one concrete example uh, that is close to show that in Germany we still have quite a few challenges of implementing uh, um, 
the, uh, the sustainable agenda for water and also for the would say water link to other sectors. And I also show it because I think it shows quite some parallels in terms of a persistent problem to what you have here face here in the prairies in Saskatchewan. So typical case in Northwest Germany. Where are we? That is Germany. So you see here that is a map that shows you the livestock density. And here, that here, this big lighter kind of spot that is Osnabrück, where my university is located in Lower Saxony. It's a bit lighter because there we have a bit more humans than pigs and um, and uh, and uh, chicken and turkeys. So it's a huge, prosperous region in terms of livestock. But uh, it's also uh, the, the, the livestock, the agriculture has definitely brought much prosperity to the region. But you also see groundwater pollution. For the reason you can see other maps that show very clear a nitrate problem since a long, long, long persistent problem. Yeah, much of the manure ends up in the end on the fields and in the end in, in the groundwater, which is causing quite some problems. So, and we have a close collaboration also with our local stakeholders, the drinking water suppliers who are very concerned, and we have no scarcity at all of regulations. And you would say, right, many regulations, Germany, things are perfect. Not always. So what has been really quite successful has been a more, we have also, if we are a federal country, most of uh, the authority for water has been uh, at the level for provinces that are the Bundesländer, and not so much at the federal level. So there was in Lower Saxony, we have a specific, a specific degree, a decree that was more for drinking water and drinking water supply areas. That is an interesting instrument where we as water consumers pay a certain amount of money that goes to the ministry, which redistributes the money to water suppliers and uh, that negotiate with farmers to really give them payments, a kind of payments for ecosystem services to have kind of less, action, less intense uh, uses in drinking water protection areas. So that is well, say quite a, um, a, a strong instrument that um, uh, the, our water suppliers have a lot of voluntary agreements. We even have a fertilizer degree. Um, uh, 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 it's a federal law that regulates how much fertilizer you are allowed and how you use it in, in the fields. But what has been much more influential, that is drinking water regulation that is federal, has been EU legislation. Let's say the European legislation had definitely been a major shift in German water governance because it really forced uh, a strong, uh, brought more, more strength to national collaboration at national level. Because since the year 2000, we have a European Water Framework Directive, which is um, uh, really regulating the state of, uh, of water. So we have to really improve the state of water in all of our fresh water bodies. And in particular, it has also a directive, a daughter directive, which regulates now that you have to protect your groundwater resources broadly, not only drinking water areas. So that is now regulation uh, law, and uh, Germany is not really good uh, in complying with that. But if you look, for example, what, what, what is interesting, that's where now already energy comes in, the sometimes of perverse kind of contradictions between policies, you see that is one of the drinking water wells of uh, that is the uh, OBV is the Oldenburg Ostfriesischer Wasserverband, that is the water supplier with whom we closely collaborate. And you see there's a trend of uh, declining nitrate levels. It still is too high. Uh, it's, it's above the, uh, the levels where we are allowed to use this for drinking water. But the kind of efforts they did with the, uh, the protection in this kind of areas really helped. But now it starts again to increase. So there was a question is what is happening? And what is happening, one of the things that most likely uh, that, that clearly has contributed is we have a boom in biogas production because in the year 2000 we had this shift in Germany, uh, right, we have to move to renewable energy kind of system. So we have uh, Erneuerbares Energiengesetz that is, a, that is a law that really funds or gives a lot of subsidies for renewable energies, in principle great in order to really support uh, renewables, but it also gave huge subsidies for biogas, which also is in principle good to use the residues from farms in order to produce, um, produce uh, uh, biogas electricity, but as you might, it's not 
that, that requires too much imagination to really foresee if you provide such a strong economic incentive. You had a huge boom of uh, these kind of energy plants. So maize just all over the place, just planted in order to produce biogas. Investment companies coming in, skyrocketing prices also for, for land, which, which uh, in the end really was not particularly beneficial to all the kind of uh, achievements, for example, for really groundwater protection. Because if you look, uh, and, and the interesting point is we, we, we get all the, for quite a bit of fodder for our animals We come, comes in from Brazil, hmm, from Zura. We, we, uh, we, we plant maize in order to produce electricity and all the kind of, of uh, nitrates, all the nutrients end up in, in, uh, on, on the ground, in the groundwater or sometimes in the North Sea. A pretty crazy kind of balance and not particularly sustainable but pretty persistent in terms of how this whole system works. Things are starting to improve. As I said, we had uh, some um, really um, uh, fines where, um, because we, we are supposed to pay fines from the EU kind of regulation because we don't improve the, uh, the state of nitrate in the groundwater bodies. So the attempts, which by the way, as we later I still when I have time, I talk about different levels of learning. They talk now what we have. It's, it's interesting we have a kind of menu markets, you ship around the manure hundreds of kilometers, it's traveling across Germany, you get rid of all the manure. So it's, it's an interesting kind of <laughs> attempt to really stabilize the system. But the lack of policy coherence also with the regulation, that the environmental regulation for climate change, for example. And it's, it's still in a country like Germany, we have a weak enforcement of regulation, fragmentation of responsibilities, lack of political will, no monitoring and asymmetric power constellations, and abundance of data, often problems of accessibility, and it's really a polarized conflict that is more, open, more, more phrased around um, zero-sum games that people really um, stick on their kind of, of uh, um, preferred uh, solutions and approaches how things should be done. And just a final, because very recent kind of conflict that has also risen in, in our region, uh, that is more that one or two weeks ago uh, that uh, started to really pop up and they made it now even to the national level. So that is a conflict between biodiversity and agriculture on protective stripes along water in areas which nature protection status. What is it that you have um, in, uh, we have a, a European regulation that uh, you need to um, have a certain kind of uh, five meters close to water bodies, fresh water bodies. You are, should not uh, kind of protection strip where you are not allowed uh, to really have uh, high levels of intensive agriculture in order to protect the water body, the river or the lake. So that hasn't been implemented all over Germany, particularly in Lower Saxony. Now it's supposed to be implemented at least in, um, in zones with a higher protection status. So uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the regional scale around uh, in the Landkreis Osnabrück, that's the larger municipality, the, the whole region around Osnabrück, they decided that this is too much. So farmers were lobbying and the politicians decided, oh, one meter is enough. Against all scientific evidence, it's really start, they, 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 we had a huge, a huge kind of, uh, of debate in the newspaper. Now court cases will start, which is remarkable because we have, uh, you know, how current situation in Canada. At the moment in Germany, we have a huge debate about biodiversity. There have been, even in Bavaria, that is not necessarily known as the most progressive of our, in terms of um, political kind of opinion building of, uh, of our, our provinces. They have really had a, a public poll, public vote, popular vote, where they uh, um, uh, try to force and say, right, the government must do something in order to improve biodiversity and also the decline of insects. So in this time, there are still parts of the agricultural lobby that really is not even willing to implement this regulation in kind of nature protection zones. That shows uh, the kind more of politics that one has to also just take to into consideration when one tries to implement these agendas. Uh, which, which is obviously something that uh, is uh, sometimes hindering progress, but it, and that's why I said I think that kind of really quite fierce debates you have in many parts of the world seems also to hear in the kind of um, prairie region. But at least in Germany, I see some, despite these kind of latest developments, some some hope for improvement that one and address this hopefully still 
uh, in, in my final slides the, where we can move to some kind of solution. Okay, so now to check, I still have some time. Because now the last part of my lecture, I want just to summarize some of the work we are doing really on the governance kind of frontier of the research in order to really improve this situation. It's difficult to deal with politics, but yeah, one just has to take it into consideration when one really is designing or thinking about these processes. Water is a crisis of governance. I highlighted this in, in, in many countries, in most countries, and uh, different ways of really how to improve it. So I want to show you some progress of a project that has, is building on quite a bit of research that uh, we have been doing in the last couple of years. That is uh, um, uh, part of this kind of larger German program that I mentioned, uh, uh, GROW, where we have one project that I'm coordinating and I'm proud to say I still work on it, we, we research on it despite of my busy agenda still um, important to also have time for that, to really develop innovative approaches for good governance to implement uh, an integrated approach to water resource management. And the objectives that we have is to develop a diagnostic approach, tell a second what we mean by there, to look at the transferability of uh, elements of effective governance systems, because for a long time, we had these more simplistic panaceas, very simplistic solutions just transferred all over the world, and we still lack also, I would say there is still, still a scope for, for more work in the scientific community, uh, an approach where you really make a diagnosis and say, right, what are the kind of criteria why a certain instrument work in certain conditions and not in order to be able, can we also use it in other kind of situation and context. And also support transformative change and in uh, particular also support implementation of the SDGs. We collaborate closely with the people who do the monitoring implementation of the IWM target for SDG 6 that I mentioned before. So what are we doing? Just in terms of a bit more, often these structures are a bit more boring, but in this case it really shows a bit more the logic of the work that we are doing. We have spent much more time than we wanted to really develop this diagnostic approach, but now we have really a good framework that we can implement in all our cases. We, on one hand, we analyze the governance system, but also we have a participatory approach. So we currently, and I report more a bit where we, our focus is now on in-depth case studies. And uh, I hope that in uh, next time when I come for the Global Water Futures, I, not I hope, I'm convinced that I can show you also more of the results, because we are just in the phase of really evaluating all the data from the in-depth cases to then move in the next round to validation case studies where we will have a different kind of approach, a different method, more a programmatic method to get data from a far bigger range of case studies to really add further cases in order to, to really have a larger library in order to develop this kind of, uh, of insights. And I hope that we can also get here some insights from cases that you have here in Germany to have more long lasting, not toolbox, but really long lasting kind of process to uh, add further experiences and have an, an improvement of insights there. Good, so where are our cases? So uh, we have cases, uh, two cases in Germany. The one where you see here with the manure is the one I just mentioned. And uh, one in uh, Guadalquivir in Spain, that is more water scarcity, a big water scarcity issue. We have uh, one in Mongolia, where we have also quite a bit of mining, but also more drought area. And one in South Africa, we are very active, where we have all different kinds of water quality and water scarcity problems. And a more recent uh, case that has been more added in Iran, as I in the root base in uh, Isfahan, that has been, uh, um, we have been approached by colleagues from Iran who bring in their own money in order to work with us because they also want to see whether we can uh, support them in improve, helping finding some governance solutions in Iran, which I have to say is definitely not an easy case to include. All right, so how are we doing? What are we doing? So that's a bit more, on one hand, we have this kind of, uh, um, you could say, the scientific approach, or the, the more approach guided by a framework, where I'll uh, show you in a second a bit more um, uh, the, what are the components, where we try to uh, analyze the governance system, uh, how it's performing in a certain context. And with that, we are, in each of these in-depth cases, we have a participatory process 
where we move more and look at case-specific kind of diagnosis, look also at solutions that have worked or don't work, and order, try to also lift again, you can say therapy, lift up again the experience more at the higher level of our framework in order to see, all right, can we from this case experiences make some judgments why certain things worked or not, in order really to, say, to find solution approaches for classes of similar problems, but also what we call diagnosis to really improve and add further cases to improve our diagnostic strength. So the kind of approaches that we have that it hasn't remained so abstract, we have on one hand, we have performance measures, say what are the coordination outcomes you really achieve when we look at uh, uh, for example, the case in, um, uh, that I just mentioned in, in, uh, in Northwest Germany. Are there any outcomes of coordination? Could we observe them? Has learning occurred? Are, um, what is the state of interplay between ecosystem services? We have also water security indicators. We look at the structure of governance. These are more the institutions, the legislation, but also actor networks, the power structures, the instruments that are available. But we look then also, uh, one half is the structure, what are the real kind of processes, how is planning and policy implementation, how is it implemented, how does it work in practice. Also in terms of knowledge information management, for example, and also address context like hydroclimatic context, uh, uh, but also more the political system, the kind of development, uh, and et cetera. So now I try briefly to highlight some of the kind of major insights that we have, the kind of areas where we consider are of key importance in order to really to understand what makes such a governance system work or not. On one hand, and that I think is summarizing quite a bit of insights we have here in terms of research that we do on water governance uh, over the past year, years or so. <clears throat> What has been shown uh, very strongly that polycentric systems that have more flexible coordination across sectoral administrative boundaries are very beneficial to address complex governance problems and really are more, uh, uh, support more, more improved governance solutions. So what is a polycentric system? So I've shown you, we did some analysis, it was a prior project, not the one uh, that, that I just mentioned, the STEER project, where we looked at polycentric system or fragmented system and centralized system. And when I talk about polycentric system, I mean I'll talk more in the terms of also how the Ostroms really coined the term, Eleanor Wins and Ostroms, that you combine a distribution of power, distribution of authorities with coordination. Yeah? So you have a high vertical and a high um, a horizontal coordination across sectors, across spatial units, but also across uh, um, administrative levels. And we found in quite a few cases that performance is high, and this was really more adaptation to climate change that we measured here. And fragmented means that you have decentralization, you often see this, but you have no coordination of responsibility, and centralized implies that you have a centralized system, no coordination either. So, and uh, we had found some prototypical examples. The Netherlands are really a kind of prototypical example of very strongly but, uh, but more polycentric system. India, but also quite a few countries in uh, South America have moved from de decentralization has mainly led to fragmentation and uh, more the centralized countries with no coordination, Uzbekistan and also some of the countries still in, in uh, South America are, are pretty, pretty with a strong central government. Um, are not performing very much. Often in these countries, what happens, centralization leads also, puts power to rent-seeking individuals. That is one of the issues that you find mostly there. And simply decentralization doesn't solve this problem. It doesn't go away with this. So uh, that, that requires more substantive reforms. And that brings me already to my next issue. Uh, no, no, that's the over next that I would have formal informal institution. The other kind of issue that we also look at is the interaction between governance modes, markets, bureaucratic hierarchies, and networks. So what do we mean there? Often when you look at instruments that you may have different kinds of styles and there have often been different kind of preferences for this or one of the other instrument, either the hierarchical style, command and control, 
market style work mainly with monetary incentives like, for example, water markets or network style that has been uh, with uh, different kinds of fashions where you mainly work on voluntary agreements, kind building on trust. And we see that more and more that we try to find hybrid instruments that connect these kind of aspects. That is a key issue how to really also, because each of these instruments approaches as kind of strengths and weaknesses, how we can combine them. And that's why I talked about meta governance, which is not always so easy. You may have the um, stick and carrot example. Uh, you can also sometimes go wrong when you try to combine these instruments. So we found in quite some examples, for example, you can easily engage people, work on participation, and then decide in a hierarchical mode where you just crowd out the voluntary agreement of these people. So, and that's definitely someone who has not been able to really combine sticks and carrots very carefully. So that was one hand, we have these polycentric structures. You have more the coordination combined with um, decentralization. You have different ways of how to coordinate, yeah? Different logics, more hierarchical, more market-based approaches, but also more voluntary agreements uh, that we need to better understand how these interact. And also more synergistic, not conflictual relationships between formal and informal institutions. So that uh, has been something that has been uh, analyzed quite uh, long, or no, quite long, it has been more analyzed regionally um, concept uh, from people that did some analysis in Latin America. Do we have effective or non-effective formal institutions? Effective means that more or less um, you have a, a working a jurisdiction. And uh, what we normally want, and with all also that relates to the governance modes and relates also to my previous idea in terms of building these polycentric structures, have more synergies between this kind of informal learning kind of environments and formal binding rules, legislation. But what you often find is competing. Uh, what in practice it means you have corruption overrides or this kind of informal institutions are more um, important for decision making than legislation. And that's when things are not, uh, you have uh, then conflicting goals in terms of sustainability. And uh, what we also see, for example, the case of South Africa, we often see more substitutive kind of relationships where these informal structures try to substitute this. Another interesting and important point to see how you can find the pathway really from competing to complementary, because if you want to leave no one behind, you have uh, to really make sure that you have to get a more equitable of system where these kind of competing relationships and power structures can't dominate. All right, and now let me come to my final point here on these uh, issues that we have on looking at these various governance aspects. We've seen and we think we very strongly work with the ecosystem services approach because that really makes complex interdependencies and trade-offs more meaning, more explicit and meaningful. So on one hand, so just we work with a kind of ecosystem service trade-offs. So anyone who may, if you want to learn more about this, you may need to come more to the Global Water Futures meeting in uh, May, where I probably then, as I said, I will focus more on the results we get from our worst cases. But see, all right, under which conditions to certain trade um, um, uses, land uses, we may got ecosystem service uses, uh, do you get trade-offs or not? Work with this trade-off matrix in order to see how we obviously can avoid them, move from trade-offs to synergies. And this kind of analysis can also help. For example, that is just, in terms of an ecosystem services approach, the kind of system I've shown you before, you know, this Nexus example in, um, in uh, uh, northern Germany where we had water suppliers, drinking water suppliers, biogas producers, livestock farmers, you have here um, uh, the different kind of provisioning services, fresh water, biomass for energy, livestock. We see here drinking water suppliers. We often note that drinking water suppliers have a much bigger awareness for provisioning, ecosystem, uh, for regulating ecosystem services. So the kind of water fuel regulation and water purification. And we also work more with really different ways of business models, a much broader understanding of of uh, a kind of business models that uh, look at a much broader array of ecosystem services rather than focusing on only one. But this kind of analysis and uh, putting this in a debate can really bring you one step further from an analysis to also finding some solutions. And the final slide here on this is 
there may be a whole range of governance or, or uh, coordination instruments that can support uh, to, to find a more kind of overcoming these trade-offs. You could have legislation on integrated landscape management that is more wishful thinking. We don't have this yet. Land use is unfortunately not regulated. That would be very important. We have cooperative agri-environmental schemes. That is something where, where we, we, we have it in parts, also in the Netherlands, in parts of Europe. You may have payments for ecosystem services. New business models, we currently work on, on that, but also more solidary agriculture. That's a very new way of uh, how, for example, you organize agriculture and direct links to consumers. So now I'm nearly at the end. Having said this, so you have seen this plethora of analysis when we look at the different governance failures, but also perhaps how to overcome them. Now I need to still very briefly think about how to really support now transformative change, also when you see these kind of instruments that I've shown you just in the previous slide. Now one of my favorite slides, the triple loop learning. The thing is that we also really require transformative change. It will not be a simple blueprint how you in, in can implement a kind of transformative agenda. So, and this kind of uh, analysis from single, double to triple loop helps you know, quite a bit to communicate this kind of approach, uh, but also to, as, as a kind of, of lens of analysis to see does learning occur or not. So it really shows trust. It has originally been developed for individual learning, for organizational learning, has been also um, uh, been implemented to look more at societal learning uh, among uh, from different people, one is myself, to understand, okay, you may have single loop learning, which means if you have an action that leads to an outcome, you just improve or, or try to do the wrong thing better. Like if you have uh, water scarcity, you increase irrigation efficiency, you divert rivers, but you don't think very much about whether the current water use pattern is sustainable. Double loop learning is a reframing. You start at least to discuss, to debate. For example, ask at least, and that we often are in the stage of discourse, are current land use practices sustainable? Do we need cross-sectoral policies? Water energy foot nexus. So the water energy foot nexus is, an, I would say, a response to really seeing that IWM is wishful thinking, but you can't implement integrated water resource management from the water sector because you need to integrate across these kind of different sectoral policies. Oops, uh, what was this? That was a bit strange. Uh, that, that's the last thing that should show up here, which doesn't want to show up probably. I've just uh, um, deleted something pre previous, uh, um, in, my, in my slides when I deleted one of the, the arrows and didn't check it anymore. What should show up now is that you have, let me go here, now the triple loop learning that came and disappeared, probably that's uh, an indication of that it's so difficult. Hmm? that didn't show up. Triple loop learning really implies that now you really change things. Yeah? You really change legislation. You move from uh, um, uh, move, implementing new paradigms, change education, but also move here from discourse to structural change. Why do I show this? Because much of this whole change that we want to implement, probably you can't just design them. It will be much more a process of, uh, would say, self-organization combined with purposeful design, and that's also putting, putting quite a challenge also to really uh, uh, supporting here policy agenda. Now, but now I, let me come to my final reflections, and definitely I have to come to those, because uh, I'm close to, I think I'm not with 45 minutes, and still want to have some time for uh, some discussions. So um, turning challenges in, into opportunities. The SDG 6 can be uh, a key in catalyzing transformative research and policy agenda, but as I highlighted briefly in my last slide, transformation is something that is better described as an evolutionary learning process than a very well steered uh, policy, international policy agenda that needs to be taken into consideration. They can't, uh, not, you can't see them in isolation, but more as a web of interdependencies. Implementation needs to engage different stakeholder groups and cut across different levels. That is very important. For example, in our case, uh, a project that I've shown, we really also work more at the management level when you look at IWM, not only at the national level, to bring these levels together. 
And we need a stronger emphasis on a diagnostic approach and not only on national reporting to meet obligations uh, when we really want to move this forward. We developed also a policy brief where we strongly advocated you need to engage much more stakeholders into this whole process. And I think also, just to finalize here, Canada could also take perhaps even more global leadership in this process. There is already, I would say, um, we have just started with this, uh, uh, the whole afternoon and also the invitation or the introduction to my talk. We have these definitely very also leading uh, um, research projects that are ongoing here that have uh, started to get more and more attention. I think getting more, even more involved in really in policy implementation I think would be an important step in order to bring also these insights one step further in order to uh, not having them only ending up in scientific papers in the end, also showing that Canada as a country, but also Canada in terms of the model, how things are done, can really also contribute to an implementation on a broader scale. And with that, I want to also give the voice. We have uh, heard the prayer of an elder at the beginning, which I think is always very impressive when I come to Canada to still be this uh, remnants to these kind of traditions. Look more at a young lady. I came across this lady uh, she was speaking one year ago at World Water Day 2018 at the UN in New York. I saw her picture in the report on the, um, that was prepared for the High Level Political Forum. And, uh, you know, generally we have these UN General Assemblies. Uh, civil society is sitting more at the corners and can watch, and sometimes civil society get also a voice. And this lady was invited and she gave her speech to all these leaders of the world. And I think she addressed some important points were uh, that, that really she, she highlighted, that is I think also the part of still present in the kind of tradition and spirit of uh, First Nations, in many First Nations, this dichotomy between uh, humans and nature is not as present as we often perceive it and unfortunately also implemented in our policies. So that, that, that we also need to acknowledge our waters with personhood that can be protect our waters. So that also would, when I said leaving no one behind, that's evident when we don't want to leave behind people. We also are not allowed to leave behind environment and waters. And I think with these very insightful statements, I, this young lady, I want to finalize my talk. Thank you and look forward to some discussion. Thank you so much. We, we have time for some questions. Maybe I'll start off with one as, as we start moving forward. You talked about fragmented uh, yeah. governance systems and some that are centralized and some that are fully distributed. Where do you think Canada fits in there? I would say that I, at the currently at my, my current kind of knowledge that I've done, I would put it more in the fragmented realm. <laughs> Because uh, what uh, it seems that uh, you, uh, as many of these countries, a bit more a neoliberal agenda. We have, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as for example, Australia. Yes, but fragmentation. I would particularly say if you look at the, um, the national and the provincial level, where and and also in terms of. But we also could say to some extent we have fragmentation in Germany in terms of the sectoral policies. But I would say there are two kinds of fragmentation, really, in terms of water governance, which to some extent has been overcome in Germany by really, or has been, has been support to overcome them by EU legislation. Mm -hmm. That has really put again an umbrella and coordination, but that is still very prevalent in Canada. It's what I would say is also perhaps one of the reasons why you don't have even national reporting on the IWM target. And uh, on the other hand, you still, there is still a lot of just which I think is quite typical in many of the countries, uh, many fragmented responsibility regarding the water sector. So that, that identifies a very nice objective for global water futures, doesn't it? Anyway, other questions? Yes. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. So um, the network that you showed, two of them, I was looking at those and I was thinking, um, could it be done for capacity of, or, or the value chains of different SDG indicators, how they're interlinked? So for example, education, which part ah. of the value chain is interlinked with water's value chain? And uh, that brings me to the other point, is the capacity to report 
those indicators. So SDG6 has how many? Eight targets, 11 indicators, and many sub-indicators, right? In countries, the capacity is different. So we decided the indicators, but we don't know at the very beginning who can report what or whether they can actually report it or not. So that that's also brings us to the governance question is how we can improve those countries' ability and develop their capacity. So my first one was a comment and the second one is a question. Yeah. Uh, right. The first was a comment whether one could really use the network I showed b between the various... Right, right. Uh, there are now some methods and we also work here um, as a cross-cutting group works on methods to uh, develop, uh, not to, uh, to some have pragmatic methods to look at uh, trade-offs between SDGs, also in reporting, which are kind of matrix methods that really tries to indicate us, but also to really try to look more in terms of interlinkages. Is that what you wanted to say, is it? And, and, and this in the internet. So, for example, education, it's, it has yeah. a value chain, whereas water has its own value chain and different yeah. components, right? So, how those are interlinked. Yes, are I said, that's what, 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 it's, but it's not so easy. For example, it's not, not necessarily easy and evident because we also worked on this kind of interaction matrices and you may have different kinds of interactions. You may be beneficial or non-beneficial, but the first thing is really to try to see when do we have a beneficial interaction or not. Right. And as I highlighted, there are uh, at least approaches where one tries to say, how would we really, can, can we map these interdependencies? And in order to make also the next step, in order to see, right, what does it mean or under which conditions do we have a more synergy rather than a trade-off between these goals? And the second step, I, I don't know whether I kept, got your um, question entirely completely. You asked how we can build capacity with, with these countries right. that so, are, don't have it. Yes, because um, we are deciding the indicators yeah. Altogether, the statisticians, yeah. water experts coming in without actually considering the statistical or the ground reality of putting those data in. So in countries like in Africa, in Bangladesh, or some uh, Asian countries where they don't have the capacity. No, I, would, I think the, the effort when this was decided uh, definitely engaged all the, uh, the countries in everywhere in the world. So that was an attempt to find uh, a compromise that you can at least have reporting that also uh, is, is, uh, um, is possible for, for all these countries. I don't know about all the other targets, but I know for the water target, there are initiatives that, uh, where, where countries collaborate in order to support them, in order to build the capacity yeah, to really get the data. But the other thing is, once you have the data, I think one is to have the capacity of the data. Um, why do these countries collect the data? And is the process of data collection also supporting a transformative research agenda? For example, our countries only show up uh, some kind of indicators not to be uh, either that they're not left behind. The other reason that countries may show up perhaps the real data in quotation marks is that they want money. But do they, that they say, right, if we, we show all the problems, we probably get more financial support. But will countries are also willing to really address the failure within their own system, like uh, the lack of governance capacity, corruption, lack of, uh, uh, of, of really reliable kind of, of implementation structures, which is a bit more, but it's a more the tough thing that needs to be implemented. And that's why, for example, with the IWM target, we also work uh, and want to work with some of the countries that are willing in order to move one step further from just reporting to considering how to improve to also perhaps get some leading countries that might also um, uh, engage with others in order to support this. It, it, the efforts are ongoing, but it also depends on the willingness of the countries themselves in order that they really want to improve uh, the situation. And it's always difficult to interfere with sovereign countries. That's why I consider this SDG process has to become part of the different groups in these various countries that uh, strengthen also civil society in order to put perhaps more pressure sometimes on governments in order to really improve the situation. That's a bit what I can currently say. Great. Great. Other questions? I've got another one. Water wars. Sorry? Water war. Water war. Water war. Uh huh. See, um, going back, you, you 
mentioned the importance of cooperation, collaboration, um, but some water experts over several decades have said that we're at risk of imminent water wars in various parts of the world. We haven't quite maybe had a full-blown water war yet. Your thoughts on that? I have to say that is not necessarily my own work of research that I can't really draw on my experience in really analyzing uh, the whole potential reason of conflicts and how they're linked to wars. But there is quite some evidence as well that water has led to cooperation. Right. So water is, uh, that, that is often not highlighted. And I remember some years ago we had uh, um, uh, a workshop uh, that's about nearly 10 years ago, a workshop in Bonn where we just addressed this topic and different people. And uh, I was interviewed by a newspaper and said, all right, what, water may also lead to cooperation. And the newspaper was not at all interested. I said, was as much more interesting, which I find remarkable in terms of not wanting to hear the positive or the positive message. But there is also evidence that water uh, can lead also to more cooperation because it can show the kind of need in order to really collaborate. I would say the more asymmetric the power structures, the more difficult it will be to really move to collaboration rather than uh, really more, more conflictual uh, relationships. So, but, but the situation can become very dire, I can agree. But, but there's also scope for hope. Yes, yes. Canada's first treaty as an independent country was a water treaty with the United States. And so, uh, not a water war. And it's, it's interesting. The, uh, the cooperative aspects seem to win out. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, just wondering if uh, there have been some uh, examples of uh, integration of information technologies to help in the governance of, uh, or there is a potential, is there potential like of having information technologies helping in the governance of water? Uh, there, uh, I would say there's some work, obviously you can uh, have uh, data collection, you have more citizen science that is become, and, and sometimes I know in India there are examples where really citizens were equipped with the kind of, the, they could report on water quality issues that really uh, helped in order to put a bit more, or to, to support uh, or encourage, put it more friendly, the bit reluctant authorities to do something about the problem. So you can really kind of can have, be an empowerment in order to really engage uh, um, uh, citizens with this whole thing. More information technology is more broader. I, uh, there, currently there is a huge emphasis also more on using the whole remote sensing in order really to get data on a, on a global scale, which would then at least provide a better data on the state. In particular, in the ecosystem, there is a huge effort because that could be uh, at least uh, one step forward that we get a better idea about disappearance of ecosystems, which would then also help to get better kind of solutions. So that is currently working. So this kind of um, uh, in, in or more empowering, but also really getting broadly using this, uh, getting, getting more data. And obviously now the kind of linkages that you can connect, community initiatives can connect across the world, can be also very powerful in order to, I would say in the SDG process can also really help in order to build a momentum for, for certain kinds of, of uh, global initiatives that can also put certain things more on, on, on the agenda. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I noticed that you had something on one of the slides about the need for cross-sectoral policies in regards to water energy food nexus. If you are, if you can make any recommendations to like say a small developing country, what kind of policies would you um, recommend for them to use? You say recommendations for developing countries? Yes, for um, cross-sectoral policies. Uh, generally, one, one thing is, obviously in developing countries, policy implementation is generally, <laughs> uh, we've been working quite a bit in South Africa, and for example, South Africa has one of the most advanced water regulations in the world, but still is very much uh, lacking in implementation. So that is one thing, but in terms of cross-sectoral policies, in terms of water, is 
uh, agriculture and uh, um, water needs to get, get better uh, exchange. And also more generally what we would need probably is instruments at the level of land use. Where, uh, and, and not only in developing countries, also in developed countries, where you would have a more broader planning on how land, which kind of land uses do we have. We don't have policies or implementation instruments that really look at land use, because I would say, and, and that, as I said, we, we need to move more away from integrated water management to a kind of integrated landscape management. If you look at the landscape more integrated way, which would on one hand mean that you look more at the, at the policies, at the level of policies, but also at the level of instruments, give more freedom, and that what happens at least in Europe, you give more freedom at the national or sub-national level to implement policies, but for that you need instruments that you can look, for example, at like if you make a land use decision, how does it affect water and other things that you, you develop targets there. So, but I would say agriculture and water is definitely a key issue that needs more, uh, more cross-sectoral improvement. I think we are... I think that's it for questions, and uh, again, I want to thank you so much for giving the first Howard Wheeler lecture. You've held his name in great honor, and uh, it is a wonderful, very thought-provoking uh, presentation that uh, will help us tremendously in the year to come. So thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Claudia, don't go away. Let's see, we'll stand out here so they can photograph you. We have this to present to you. The, uh, Doesn't even fit here to my clothes, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it matches your scarf. It's uh, carefully designed. Uh, but anyway, uh, noting you as the, uh, as the recipient of the Howard Reader Lecture. So thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Yes. Enjoy. Okay, very good. So, that's, uh, so that was a bit of history there. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I would like to announce uh, our two award winners for the GIWS awards. And the first one is on research excellence. And, and this, uh, this particular award uh, goes out to a GIWS researcher. It's adjudicated by a panel uh, involving um, outside societies and the provincial government. And uh, in this case, we're looking for excellence in research. Um, and uh, the award committee this year has decided to honor Grant Ferguson with the award uh, based on his international stature, the impact of his research, his training of highly qualified personnel, and research productivity. And of course, Grant is an eminent groundwater researcher uh, who is conducting very important research on uh, deep uh, groundwater aquifers, how they connect to surface uh, groundwater and, uh, and to surface water supplies, and has, uh, but has had a, a wide variety of research over the years. And so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, bring Grant up, and uh, so we can. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you for the selection committee for selecting me. Uh, I guess I got a couple other quick thank yous. I think uh, Matt Lindsay has something to do with all this, uh, and of course, thank you to my family. Well, I guess what I want to talk about today is 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 the situation for groundwater and what I see as an emerging issue and an important issue here in in Western Canada. And uh, very much I, I see myself kind of building on, on research and people who I've been lucky to work with over the years and, and learn from. So I guess starting from, from days way back when, uh, as an undergraduate here at, uh, at Waterloo, rather, had the pleasure of being taught by one of our uh, alumni from, from uh, my own uh, college, uh, Dr. John Cherry, and uh, kind of see myself as, as part of a long line of prairie hydrogeologists who I've had the pleasure of working with the Garth Vanderkamps and the Bob Betchers and the Jim Henrys of the world. So what I'm showing you here is, is uh, I think, maybe where we're headed in some of the issues that, that we're looking at. So typical groundwater uh, stress type studies will often show this type of figure, all these pivot irrigation type systems, and you know, it looks like the high plains of the US or something like that. But this is actually in southern Alberta. So most of this actually right now is, is surface water, but I think where we're headed is some of this is going to have to be replaced by groundwater. So we're looking at a couple different issues here. First of all, the, this part of the Saskatchewan River watershed is almost fully allocated. There's no more surface water left for irrigation. 
And then we're looking at a couple of issues uh, with regards to climate change. One of them has been touched on and more often than, than I, maybe we care to think about by our GIWS crew here. I mean, John Pomeroy's group in terms of what, what snowpack and melting ice in the, in the Rockies is going to do to things. But I think we have some other issues to think about. And, and that's part of our situation here in terms of we are going to lose surface water. We are having increasing demands for a variety of reasons. I'll touch on a few of those things here. But I'll point back to this, and I think John almost had, also had something to do with uh, this report that came, back, came out 10 years ago this year, which is from the Canadian Council of Academies on Sustainable Groundwater Management in Canada. Why I bring this up is, is, is uh, a conversation with Steve Hollish, who's worked in the Toronto region uh, for, for years, who also was part of this. He, kind of struck me at the time when they were doing the consultation. He said that one of the largest problems with groundwater uh, resource uh, research in Canada is we don't have these big problems, right? We don't have a high plains or a central uh, valley that's, you know, being depleted. We can't see these things. You know, we asked Jay Family Eddie for the maps of where, being, where we're seeing depletion in Canada. It's not there yet. But that doesn't mean we don't have issues. And I'm a little concerned that 10 years later, I'm not sure we're doing much of a better job, and uh, maybe we are kind of at a crossroads for groundwater research in Canada. So one of the reasons I'll, I'll point that, that this might be coming, and I pointed to the irrigation issue a little bit earlier, so we start to look at what agriculture might look like in the future. So this is put out there in terms of uh, corn heat units uh, from the Climate Atlas of Canada. And what we're seeing here is a shift, and I'm not suggesting that we're necessarily going to grow corn in the Kindersley area, although the, the records seem to indicate that it is creeping into places like Manitoba and other places uh, in Western Canada. Kindersley, all of a sudden, their heat units for, for growing corn is going to start to look like southern Ontario, or maybe South Dakota, or something like that, right? So agriculture is going to change. Those opportunities are going to change. And you know, sometimes these decisions are made based on you know, the number of uh, frost-free days or, or the amount of uh, heat coming in. And you know, if you look at what's gone on in places like California, they haven't really considered the amount of water that's available and can we do this sustainably. So that's resulted in things like this. So we look at uh, where we are seeing depletion in the United States. So there's the High Plains Aquifer. We've seen a massive amount of depletion and, and essentially the water is, is gone. There's nowhere left to go. So, it leads to a lot of questions in the southern high plains about what, what groundwater use is possible still and is irrigated agriculture part of their future. So thinking about where that comes from, I mean, we often talk about these things and some of these things are connected and some of them aren't and I've kind of positioned myself that I don't always play nice with, uh, with the people doing more kind of integrated groundwater studies and, and I think that's, that's probably a valid point in some cases. Some of these things are connected and some of them are not, and we have to be sure that we're not just making things unnecessarily complex. But one of the things to take away here is that when we talk about the amount of groundwater depletion, the amount we pump is usually more than the groundwater uh, that's missing from the ground. So there are these connections to surface water, and as much as we've seen these disastrous things in, in the Central Valley of California, massive subsidence and wells going dry, it's actually had a larger impact on surface water than it has groundwater. So on top of that, there's all these other issues around groundwater depletion that I think we probably are seeing more here in Canada, although maybe we don't have the best monitoring in our last presentation in terms of you know, how good are we doing in terms of our research and reporting and all these things. I think this does come across. So one of the largest uh, water issues uh, across, across the world is, is nitrates in groundwater. We heard that that was uh, an issue in Germany in our last talk. Uh, it's all over the United States, and we certainly see it in, in groundwater. It's been a known issue in agricultural regions uh, in Canada, whether that's you know, the Abbotsford uh, area of British Columbia. There's certain areas of the Canadian prairies, especially areas uh, where we have had uh, more fertilizer applied or uh, intensive livestock, and certainly in, in places like southern Ontario or the Annapolis Valley of, of Nova Scotia. So again, we're kind of depleting our usable groundwater resources from the top down the same way we are, we've got dropping water tables in places like, like uh, the central high plains and the southern high plains. We're taking things out by contaminating it. And then we look at some of the issues that we are seeing here in Canada. And this is, I guess, the groundwater energy food nexus in a different sort of way. So this was something that was brought to my attention and often maybe I don't think these things out quite as well as I should. And I talk to reporters about you know, problems with the oil and gas industry. So a, a CBC reporter actually brought this to my attention that you know, between you know, the beginning of 2017 and last summer, 
there was 121 produced water leaks on top of you know, almost as many oil leaks from pipelines and oil wells and whatnot from, from the oil and gas industry. And I said, well, that's interesting. That sounds like quite a bit. But if you dig into the records that the province of Saskatchewan has, the number is more like 19,000 over the last two decades. So we've got all kinds of problems, and, and these are relatively well known. Whether or not we're handling them well or not, that's another question. But we know we're, we're removing, I guess, arable land in this case, but this is going to have an impact on underlying shallow groundwater supplies. Where these things all, all come to a head, I guess, is, is one of the strategies that's been out there in terms of de depleting aquifers, which hasn't worked so well in, in you know, the central part of the United States, but has been something that has worked in places like like Southern California and Arizona and, and Nevada is, for whatever reason, they have really deep available fresh groundwater resources. And my apologies, I think some of you may have seen this in, in a previous GIWS lecture, but uh, I'm rehashing this kind of with the Canadian angle today. So part of this, I mean, it kind of comes down to this idea, which has been, been presented in, in work that uh, I've done with, with Jennifer McIntosh and uh, Deb Perone and Scott Jacheco, and we continue to do different follow-up studies on this, but essentially thinking about this is that We've got J Family Eddy and that sort of work looking at these dropping water tables throughout the world, which is obviously a huge issue. And then we've also got contamination from the top down, whether that's you know, spills from pipelines, nitrates, other surface contaminations. But what we've been thinking about in my research group, and I've got a few students in the audience who I should thank and a few others who had to run off and take care of my lab this afternoon, so good to have that resource. Uh, but, but thinking about what we've done in Western Canada, kind of from the bottom up, and mostly that's our oil and gas industry. It's also our potash industry, but we've, we've certainly had a lot of activity going on there. And then we have this area that, that Jim Hendry worked in for years, and we're trying to pick up the ball and run with that to think about what's happening in between, right? Because we have data down here from the oil and gas industry, and we sort of have data up here. I mean, working with, with the province and, and getting past you know, privacy and, and whatnot to get access to shallow groundwater issue is, has been a, a bit of a task in some parts of Canada, but we certainly have some information there. And then there's this you know, here be dragons area in the, in the center. So essentially, you can think about this. I mean, there's a bunch of different competitors in, the, in, this, uh, in this area, right? We are looking at the oil and gas industry. And then we've got other players like carbon sequestration, geothermal energy, all looking for a piece of that, that deeper subsurface. And then thinking about how that might interact with our, our shallower groundwater uh, supplies is, is, is a, a pending issue for, for Western Canada. So to think about just what we've done here in Western Canada already, if we think back to Jim Hendry's work and, and other work uh, on kind of prairie recharge, you know, if you look at Masaki Hayashi's work, most of Canada's west gets, you know, a few millimeters of, uh, of groundwater recharge, maybe as much as a centimeter some places. And if you ask Jim, he keeps on making the same measurements. I don't know how many papers he published on the isotopes of shales and clays. And it's moving kind of at centimeters since the last glaciation. Not much to see. But if you look at what we've done kind of to move water around, we've moved 23 billion cubes, as in 23 cubic kilometers of water. We've dumped that into the, into the ground in the Western Canada sedimentary basin. So we've got this happening. So if you spread that out all over the place, we've got about that much extra water spread out throughout Western Canada, which doesn't sound like much. But in terms of the natural part of the hydrologic cycle, that should be stagnant water that's not moving anywhere. And all of a sudden, it is. So that brings together some questions. I think this is a bit of an exaggeration, and, and maybe we're adding things up a little bit too much. But there have been a number of reports that have come out over the past few years that have, just, have, that have tagged just what sort of liability we're looking at from the oil and gas industry in Western Canada. So 100 billion is definitely kind of for shock value. It's a little on the high side. But there have been reports come out from the Auditor General in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan that probably pegs it at you know, $10 billion plus. And there was a recent report last week that, that showed that you know, this is increasing at about a billion dollars a year in northeastern British Columbia worth with their shale gas industry. So we've got a bit of an issue here. And it's not really clear how to address this and how shallow, and ground, shallow groundwater is going to play with, with whatever the energy industry is up to uh, at depth. And so we looked at this in the United States, mostly just because data is more available, you know, despite you know, whatever we might say about our American friends, the USGS does make data relatively available. And so what we're looking at here, these are the depths of water wells, kind of so the 95th percentile in dark blue. And this is the extent of fresh water, water with you know, a salinity that we could drink without putting it through reverse osmosis. And then beyond that, 
and this has become an issue in the United States. There's something like 600 municipalities in the United States that are using reverse osmosis of uh, brackish groundwater supplies to supply uh, uh, municipalities for domestic supplies. So that would be a potential resource going forward. And we can see there are places in the western United States, you know, the places like the Baca in Arizona and the Bighorn in Wyoming and, and uh, you know, the Great Green River. These are kind of up against the mountains, and there's a whole lot of area we can, we can go to. So that has created some issues, but there's this supply. So I don't think they're going to run out anytime soon as long as we can come up with the, the dollars to drill deeper wells. Where we do see issues here is, is there are places uh, where we do see, you know, the Permian Basin in Texas, and the Sedgwick, which is at the southern end of the High Plains, where essentially there's nowhere left to go. We've reached the bottom of fresh groundwater, and it's a lot less than what we thought. So you know, previous uh, estimates, you know, some of Tom Gleason's work and older work from back in the 70s, uh, this is Richie Adele, that was one of Jay's students, you know, just trying, trying to come up with one of these big kind of uh, ballpark studies. And that, you know, a lot of it's based on porosity permeability constraints. But if you look at water quality, we've actually got a lot less water than that. So, I'm not ready to revise those, those textbooks just yet that say, you know, groundwater is the largest store of you know, liquid fresh water on the planet. It still is, it's just the chunk of the pie is a little bit smaller. So maybe that makes surface water look more important. So less fresh water than previously estimated. And you know, there are some issues here, right, that whether or not we could actually produce to these depths, I and mean, there's economic considerations and, and the permeability kind of is on our to-do list. And so what, I guess where we wanted to bring this, and you know, there were a couple of my students in, in the audience earlier that I, I think this is, this is where we're going in Canada and trying to think about, well, what's the buffer zone do we have, right? So there are places, and I think the Bakken is probably one of those areas in southeastern Saskatchewan where we do have a large buffer zone. We're producing uh, oil from 1,000 plus meters deep, that there's a pretty good buffer of, of shales, and if Jim's calculations and isotopes are right, we don't have much to worry about. But we do have areas like in the Michigan Basin and the Wind River Basin and the Powder River Basin going into the United States to the south of us where we do have shallower oil and gas resources and we're kind of butting up against freshwater resources and what that competition looks like and whether we want to go after those oil and gas resources now or do we kind of say you know, we shouldn't be touching these because that's a strategic resource you know, in terms of increased agricultural water demand droughts, you know, lower water tables, reduced stream flow coming off the Rockies. So this seems like something that we should be getting ahead of and not just thinking about uh, oil and gas production here and now to balance provincial budgets or state budgets in this case. So with that, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at this, right? So kind of the, my take home message and I think where my research program is, is headed over the next few years and I hope this is kind of a, a key part that we can add to the whole global water futures and, and with the Institute here is thinking about you know, some of Jay's work, kind of working from the top down, and maybe other issues with, with some of our agricultural projects, and then also thinking about you know, what, what's coming from the bottom up, right? So this almost, you know, to put a dystopian view on it, it's kind of that day zero Cape Town, right? When do you run out of water because you've depleted so much from the top, and you run out of uh, decent water quality at depth, or there's no more aquifers, and you're up against you know, basement rocks or what have you. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up, and, and thanks for your attention. And uh, again, yeah, thank you for this, this opportunity to give this talk on World Water Day. Thank you. Grant, that was wonderful. And uh, thank yeah, you, definitely uh, one of our stars. So here he is. Thank you, Grant. And uh, you've got, it doesn't match your shirt, but... Uh, <laughs> I said I need a new tie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we need the green tie to go along with it, but it's, it's very good. We'll have to get Thanks. them for the group, John. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Okay, that was wonderful. Uh, our next award winner is the winner of the Best Doctoral Thesis Award in Water Security Research uh, within GIWS, and it is Leela Dehabadi from the Department of Chemistry. And the award committee has decided to honor Leela Dehbadi with the award based on her PhD thesis work, highlighting her innovation, the impact of her research in the field of study, research publications, scholarships, and other recognition, and the potential for her career growth. So uh, please come up. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am so honored to be here uh, this afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank all amazing people for uh, to, uh, who helped me in this uh, research, my supervisor, Dr. Lee Wilson, whose uh, comments and advices has always been appreciated, and my colleagues uh, in chemistry department, 
and in Dr. Wisson's group. And just uh, my appreciation uh, to GIWS uh, for this award. The title of my thesis was Development of Biopolymers and the Modified Forms as Sustainable Absorbent Materials. Most of us know that the ethanol, the bioethanol, is produced by fermentation of the sugar. But after the fermentation, we don't have 100% ethanol. And we have the mixture of the water and ethanol. It's around 12% water inside the ethanol. So the removal of the water from the ethanol is very important in biofuel processing. As you can compare here, there are different techniques for separation of the water and ethanol, like the conventional distillation, like the adsorptive distillation, and per evaporation. But when you compare the energy input, you can see the conventional distillation, which is used in industry, is very costly based on the energy input. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there are different uh, methods for separation of the water and ethanol, like the pre-evaporation, adsorptive distillation, and extract, ex uh, extractive distillation. But in my research, we prefer to use the adsorption process, which is effective and facile method for separation of the components from mixtures. As you can see the scheme, for the adsorption method, we have adsorbent and we have the adsorbate. And at room temperature, without using any energy, we can separate the components from the mixtures. This is the overall goals of my research. Develop the new adsorbent materials for increasing the uptake properties and also understanding the relationship between the structure function of the biomaterials and adsorption and hydration phenomena. This is the research strategy. First, I synthesize the new adsorbent materials, characterization of the structure of the materials, adsorption and hydration properties of the materials, in situ detection, solid liquid isotherm modeling and selectivity of these materials toward water and ethanol. I divided my talk into four parts. In the first part, I'm gonna talk about the development of the new adsorbent materials. There are different ways for modification of the adsorbent materials or biopolymers, like the different types of starch with different percentages of amylose as a linear polymer and amylopectin as a branch polymer in its structure and cellulose. As I mentioned before, we have different ways for modification of the biomaterials, like the grafting method, making the composition, and cross-linking method. But I use the cross-linking method for uh, actually modification of my biopolymers for increasing the adsorption properties of these materials. In second part, part of my research, I developed a new technique for separation of the water and ethanol. We use different types of techniques for separation of the water and ethanol, like the HPLC and GC. But actually, we found that the quantitative proton NMR is the best technique for separation of the water and ethanol, because it's a rapid technique, and also we could separate the water and ethanol at the same time. I have used the different biopolymers, as I mentioned before, the different types of starch with different percentages of amylose and amylopectin in its structure, and also the cellulose for separation of the water and ethanol. And after I used the quantitative proton NMR and used the, adsor uh, the adsorption isotherm model, I could calculate the selectivity of these materials and they modified forms for separation of the water and ethanol and detection of the water and ethanol. And actually, I got an interesting result, and I found that the starch and its uh, modified forms has, uh, have the highest selectivity compared to other materials and adsorbent materials in the literature as well. After I got an idea about the adsorption properties of the biopolymers, like the different types of starch and cellulose, I switched to the biomass materials as a new adsorbent. 
because in the structure of the biomass materials, we have cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And so I work on a miscanthus or elephant grass, which is uh, abundant and uh, inexpensive material. As you can see here, and as you can see the scheme, actually I used the raw, materi uh, raw ma biomass material, and also I did uh, treatment of these materials. I mean that I increased the percentage of the cellulose in its structure, and I increased the percentage of the lignin in its structure to see how it has effect on the absorption properties of these materials. And the result shows that the raw miscanthus materials has the highest selectivity toward water uh, compared to the treated forms. And after I uh, actually used um, the adsorption uh, properties of these materials, I did the regeneration of these materials, and I found that the relative uptake of water and ethanol decrease after the regeneration. In part four, I'm going to talk about the understanding the relationship between the structure and function of the biomaterials and adsorption properties and hydration phenomena. I use the complementary method like the uh, actually thermal analysis and the spectroscopic technique for uh, studying of uh, this uh, hydration phenomena. And actually, I studied the surface accessibility of the biopolymers uh, using the dye probe method. And actually, as uh, my understanding from this uh, research was uh, actually the hydration phenomena, which is related, related to the structure function of the materials. And for each biopolymer, the hydration phenomena is different. My PhD work led to uh, actually develop the new desiccant materials for HVAC system. We had a collaboration with the mechanical engineering, and actually because in industry right now, they are using uh, the silica gel as a desiccant in HVAC. But actually, uh, based on our publication and our suggestion, they use uh, the high amylose starch instead of silica gel in HVAC system, and they got an amazing result. Actually, the result shows that we have great absorption rate and capacity for high amylose starch compared to the silica gel materials, and energy will quoted with high amylose starch had 8% greater efficiency uh, over the silica gel material. At the end, I would like to thank again from my, to my supervisor, Dr. Wilson, and my colleagues in uh, his lab, and also the GIWS for this award. Thank you so much for your attention. We've seen some excellent uh, science and scholarship today. We uh, are hitting our mark as an institution uh, with an incredible breadth of water research uh, of tremendous societal importance. Uh, but it's also uh, it's cutting edge science, physical science, social science, environmental science. It's cutting edge policy and it's very interesting to see. And the world is watching us. So uh, carry on and we'll see you here next year. And, uh, Take care. Thank you.